Hey everybody, my name is Reverend Phoenix Coffin Williams and I am coming to you from the Temple of Holistic Knowledge in Buffalo, New York. I wanna start off by thanking you for inviting me to present at your Pagan Pride this year. I'm super grateful that you thought of me. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting on my work in using the Tarot of Hecate and the magical or spiritual technique soul retrieval in healing family or attachment injuries. But before we go into that, I would like to introduce myself a little bit more. Um, so my name is Phoenix Coffin Williams. I got my bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Buffalo in 2012. I graduated with a double major, social sciences interdisciplinary. Um, I got my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling from Goddard College in Penfield, Vermont. Um, which is a very radical school. And I'm super grateful for my education there. And so if you're interested in an education that would allow you to mix your spirituality with um, a lot of the other stuff that you might be interested in from your creative and expressive arts to your uh, social sciences to your psychology and therapy um, to your sustainability approaches to living all of those were things that were available at Goddard College um, and I know they also have a Port Townsend campus so if anyone is interested in pursuing a mix of studies that includes magical, spiritual, and some other topic that's important, check out Goddard College. Absolutely. Um, uh, I got my first, second, and third degree uh, initiations into clergy from Corellian Educational Ministries. Um, so yes, I'm a Corellian priest, and I'm super proud to be a part of that organization. Um, and the temple that I have in Buffalo is a chartered body of that uh, church. Uh, additionally, I own and operate my own private mental health clinic here in New York, and I have a therapist that works alongside me. Um, and then I also operate the Blue Door, which is a pagan pastoral uh, education program, and it's designed specifically for wicked and pagan clergy who want to do the work that I'm doing. So it's using tarot, it's using magical techniques, um, and our spirituality to enrich um, to enhance wellness uh, and to carve, help people carve out a lifestyle that is worth living. And I do that under the guise of pastoral counseling and pastoral care. And uh, very often I can get insurance companies and you know, other third party payers to assist in paying me for my services while I'm working with my clients and patients. So if any of you are interested in doing that and wanna learn more about how you're able to do that, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today, uh, I will describe or help you learn to recognize what are family attachments or attachment injuries, um, family attachment injuries, excuse me. Um, and I'll give some examples of what those are, where they come from. Um, I'll talk about how these things impact us across lifespan, so childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and advanced age. Uh, and I'll be taking a look at tarot specifically as an assessment procedure and how we can utilize that to discover what happened, what's currently happening now, and what has happened as a result of some of these attachment injuries. Um, and this information helps us design uh, what we put into the soul retrieval, which is a meditative technique. Um, or if we don't want to use soul retrieval, you know, the information that we get from the tarot of Hecate um, in this context helps us design what it is that we want to do to help the folks that we work with, whether it's meditation, whether it's yoga, whether it's breathing exercises, whether it's candle magic, whether it's poppet magic and ceremonies and all these other things. You know, the, the results of our tarot reading really are the foundations of what it is that we are going to be doing you know, with the folks that we're working for. And we'll talk about the soul retrieval karmic disentanglement from the perspective of someone who does it for individuals in a one-on-one -on -one setting, as well as someone who does it for a larger group or someone who's doing it for a coven or for you know uh, an actual workshop. So not teaching you how to do it, but actually doing it. So before we, um, yeah, here we go. So what are family injuries? Um, first of all, the thing that we have to understand about family injuries is that they are unavoidable. A lot of times they are the result of personality characteristics, preferences, and habits that we have, and they clash with other people. 
And due to strong personalities or not so strong personalities or due to certain characteristics, an injury is formed. And without enough awareness or without enough um, and, you know, insight, this can become something that turns into a lasting thing that impacts you know, individuals. Um, attachment injuries and family injuries, they begin in early childhood. And it's an experience that occurs within a family of choice or origin that results in diminished feelings of security. So anything that happens to you between you and a family member, you and someone who's really close to you, that makes you feel less secure in that relationship and less secure in like your environment. So types of family injuries, of course, include physical injuries, which are caused by physical violence and neglect. Um, so neglect as in not meeting needs, not feeding enough, not responding when children cry, not providing adequate clothing, not making sure children are in school, um, excessive labor. Uh, these lead to real and perceived danger on a child. Um, uh, and this is an example of a family injury or an attachment injury. Uh, emotional injuries include painful experiences that invalidate uh, like the emotionality of the situation. So in a family that has many siblings, you know, favoritism is, uh, is something that can lead to an emotional injury. And it can lead to an emotional injury between a, a parent and a child, and it can lead to an emotional injury between siblings. Um, gaslighting is an example of an emotional injury. Uh, and the next slide is going to lead to a YouTube video where a psychologist discusses, you know, gaslighting in more depth, because it is important for folks to understand what gaslighting is, because it's a pop psychology term right now, and it's being uh, used and misused and abused on the internet. Um, so I do want to clarify that here in this particular moment. But other types of family injuries include the mental injuries, which are verbal assaults that diminish access to peace of mind. Uh, these can be insults and derisions, bastardizations of your interests. So if you are, you know, you got a parent who loves football, but you're into martial arts. If you've got a parent who really loves um, uh, dressing up in very nice feminine clothing, but you yourself um, are a feminine person who enjoys rug rugby, um, and that would be, an, and, and you get flack about that, that would be an example of like a, a bastardization of your interest that could lead to a mental injury um, handed down from, you know, someone who's close to you, someone who loves you, uh, and is removing a sense of security from your environment, from your sense of self or identity, uh, or your sense of security in that relationship. So what is gaslighting? How to spot hidden signs? Going on Have you heard of gaslighting? Here to explain what it is, how to spot the signs, and perhaps most importantly, what to do is clinical psychologist and med circle doctor, Callie the Lab. I'm just kidding, doctor. Or a Romney. Although Callie's getting an education. Yeah, yeah Callie, yeah. I mean, I bet there's narcissistic dogs. Oh, there are. There yeah, are. Okay, yeah. so we're talking, we just filmed a series about narcissistic abuse. Mm -hmm. You can check out the link in this video description to learn more about that. But in this video, we're talking about gaslighting. Yeah. What is that? Mm -hmm. So gaslighting is a form of emotional abuse. It's where a person doubts the reality of another person, leaving that other person very, very confused. Mm -hmm. Gaslighting is sort of a signature tool of the narcissist, and they're often engaging in it to protect their fragile egos, to keep the world in line with their own reality, with little regard of how much it hurts another person when we doubt theirs. So again, it's very much a tool of manipulation, of emotional abuse, of again, second guessing someone else's reality. And there are three 
three, there are lots of things to look yeah, for, but we're yeah, going to yeah. go through three of them mm-hmm. today. What's the first one? The first one is when somebody says to you, you're too sensitive or you have no right to feel that way. Mm. When you do that, you immediately tell them that their emotional world is invalid and you're judging them for it. You have no right to feel that way as though you are judge and jury on their emotional state. Right. Okay. So what that does is it makes a person literally doubt their feeling and a feeling is a spontaneous experience. So now it's almost like telling someone you must be too hot and they're perfectly comfortable. We're telling someone they're hungry when they're not. Yeah. You know, so this is the emotional thing. When we do this emotionally, it is termed gaslighting because the person's like, I, I, what I was that, but you're telling me I don't get to be angry about this. Right. And then some people, when they're told it enough, they believe it. Right. When people are given this situation, being told you're too sensitive, you have no right to feel this way, the best thing to do is to not engage at that point because you can't win. Mm-hmm. No matter what you say, this person, if anything, by those statements, has shown that they're willing to emotionally manipulate and abuse you. There's nowhere to go in that conversation. So if they say that, maybe if anything say no that that's that is in fact how i feel Mm -hmm. and leave it at that but they're going to keep pushing at you so you can just let it go and know the conversation ends there instead of you getting into a a, a ongoing conflict with them right okay the second is deflection believe it or not deflection is a form of gaslighting because you're talking about something all right, so I'll stop it right there um, and not get into deflection. Um, but that was the gaslighting uh, that I wanted to show y'all. Very important. Uh, so yeah, gaslighting. So the main characters, these are the people who um, are most likely to perpetrate a family injury or an attachment injury. And so remember, this is not always done on purpose. Not everyone who does an attachment injury is a narcissist. Not everyone who no, does an attachment injury has been gaslighting you, although these things can be a part of it. But I mean, the main characters are parental figures. These are sibling types. These are romantic folks. And these are besties, which I also term our ride or die. That's what ROD stands for, ride or die. So our parental figures are the people who fill the expected role that parents would play. Um, So these, again, don't have to be family of origin. This can be family of choice. Um, These can be aunties, uncles, grandmas who take the role of parent for whatever reason. Um, Within these relationships, we expect caring and nurturing and various other needs to be met by them. And there's a limited expectation of uh, quality from the parentals. Sibling types are brothers and sisters, and depending on aging, these could be peers or elders that represent a playful, secure relationship with the expectation of full equality. Uh, Romantic folks, uh, these are the folks that we experience erotic and romantic desires for. These relationships carry the expectation of needs being met as well as the expectation of full equality between us. Um, And then of course, you know, depending on where you are in your life, there's a weird interaction um, where there's a blurred line between people who have sibling type energy, but who also um, uh, take up space in romantic or erotic places and, you know, also play a bestie kind of ride or die role, um, but they're not like any of those or, you know, one specific thing, right? Um, And the besties and the ride or dies, these are the people we choose to be around. Uh, and they're the ones who choose to be around us on purpose. These are the ones who know us and want to be around us anyway. We know them and we want to be around them anyway. Uh, These relationships carry the expectation of meeting social and emotional needs and full equality as well. And so injuries are formed when these expectations aren't met uh, and they aren't met consistently. And for whatever reason, we start to lose hope that they will be met. Within the family system, the cause or the etiology or the root determinant um, that is at the center of any conflictual pattern is always stress. And so these are issues like poverty, 
violence and victimization, sexual assault, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, elder abuse, healthcare issues, existing mental illness, and other causes of conflict that are less severe. So like poor communication, poor assertiveness, uh, dishonesty, um, having unreasonable expectations and social cultural factors are all things that can increase the amount of ambient stress that anyone can experience. And when someone is not skilled at managing their experience with ambient stress, the way that it gets lashed out on in the family system can be one of those ways that leads to an injury. It can be a violent thing. It can be an emotionally inappropriate thing. It can be a mentally inappropriate thing. There can be some neglect. When it comes to these issues, these attachment injuries, these family injuries, they do have an impact on us across lifespans. Um, so if you consider that in childhood, ages three to 12, that's where our templates are formed. This is where our personalities start to become molded. This is when our rasa becomes less tabula. Um, was that even the right? Yeah, like this is when our slate becomes less blank. This is when things start to become impressed upon us. This is when the sponge, you know, is starting to soak up all, all of the information, all the, you know, environmental cues and considerations that are around us. The template is formed and children learn from household environment, how to regulate emotions. We learn how to get our needs met from our providers and our peers and our needs can be met inside and outside the home with this template. So if we cry to get our needs met at home with our caregivers, we're going to cry when we are at school until we get a template that teaches us not to do that. And so you notice children when they are in, in the early school, early education, they will cry. And that still remains one of the cardinal tools that they use to signal distress. Moving into adolescence, the template becomes restructured and refined based on lived experience new emotions and new desires are popping up due to puberty um, and pubescent changes. Um, and so uh, platonic and romantic relationships exist and this becomes a context that is new and unexplored territory uh, in adolescence. And so this becomes something that is also put onto that slate. And it does depend on the feedback of the environment, what sticks to the to the slate or not. So things that we do in adolescence that work and get our needs met and get us more solidified in the group and you know get us more success and help us become seen the way we want to be seen, those things stick. All the things that get us ridiculed, ostracized, or invalidated, those things go away. And for the sake of this workshop, I did combine emerging adulthood and adulthood. Um, they're normally two separate categories but they're combined for the ease of explanation here. And emerging adulthood is the period of time for the brain to complete its development process. So, you know, the brain's not done cooking until about age 24, certainly done by age 26. Uh, and by this time, a person has been exposed to a variety of contexts in life uh, to recognize a sense of familiarity and how they wanna act and behave across situations. And adulthood is a period of life mostly growing and maintaining these gains. So in your emerging adulthood, age 26, um, there are likely cultural milestones that people have met um, and have you know, adjusted to that allow them to function in society. And so after the age of 26, everything from that point on is meant to maintain those gains uh, and to build upon them. And then in advanced age, that's preparing for the transition again. Um, and so as you can tell, I have linked the phases of adulthood um, with our archetypal images for God and goddess. So the maiden and hero, lover, matron, mother, king, matron, and sorcerer, crone. Uh, and I do this to signal some of the things that might be helpful in resolving some life on life term issues that pop up during these issues. Um, so this method of taking a look at life and taking a look at the impact that we have on each other as we grow, uh, I take a look at it both from a clinical mental health perspective, but also from the challenges presented to us in our mythologies about our gods and how 
they faced and mastered and overcome very similar challenges. Uh, so that is why I did that there. And so you can see over here in childhood, maiden hero and adolescence, lover, matron, emerging adulthood, the king, mother, and also another matron component here. And then advanced age, you've got the sorcerer and the crow. <clears throat> and so each of these you know, uh, stages in development does have a life challenge that must be completed or successfully resolved in order to be successful in the next level. So a child will become 13, whether or not they master the great lessons and challenges of their main or hero phase. Um, but will they be uh, an appropriate or an acceptable lover or matron if they've done that? Likely not. And attachment injuries do make it harder to fulfill the milestones or the transitional quests that are you know, necessary for maturity or development across these stages. All right, so attachment styles. There are four main types of attachment. Um, and this has been researched by uh, a researcher named Bowlby. It's also verified by another researcher named Ainsworth. And it's been verified in study after study after study, um, the four different kinds of attachments. Um, and I will talk about the four different kinds, how to recognize them. Um, and I'll talk about them within the context of like childhood and adulthood. And then when it comes to that stuff in between adolescence and emerging adulthood, that stuff all roll into as some of the things that could go wrong as a result of an attachment injury. And I'll start to talk about that um, when I go into the Tarot of Hecate. Uh, but for right now, let's talk about the secure attachment style. Uh, the secure attachment style is the one that uh, we call it the hallmark of like great attachment. And it is the attachment style that kind of like other attachment styles get measured against. And so we recognize a secure attachment style in children um, when we recognize that they will separate from their parents um, and they seek comfort from their parents during times of distress. They greet their parents or turn with positivity and elation and they prefer being around their parents to strangers. In adulthood, we expect to see lasting relationships based on trust, demonstrates and experiences healthy self-esteem, shares feelings with support people, and they seek out social support. And they utilize their community and, and environments appropriately. Um, uh, in contrast to that, there is the ambivalent attachment style. And in children, we recognize that when they are weary of strangers, they're greatly distressed when their parents leave, but they don't appear to be comforted when their parents return. And then in adults, we can see people who are reluctant to become close to others. They worry that their partners don't love them and they become very distraught when relationships end. Avoiding attachment style in children, uh, we see them avoiding their parents and they don't seek much comfort or contact from them. And they show little or no preference between strangers or their parents um, when it comes to getting a need met. And in adults, they may have problems with intimacy, may have little interest or emotion in social or romantic relationships, and they might be unwilling or unable to share their thoughts or their feelings with other people. Um, and additionally, they might even struggle with sharing their preferences for things. So if you're in a group with someone or a few people and someone really struggles to tell you what they would like to have for dinner while you're trying to make a group decision, that could be you know, a sign of some avoidant attachment. It's not the only sign. You can't run around diagnosing people now that I've said that to you, but it can be an indicator. And then the disorganized attachment style is, um, it's kind of a powerful one. And it's one that I do want to talk a little bit more in depth about. And it's one that I do want to talk about from a couple of different lenses. So in the disorganized attachment style in infancy and by the age of six, we see a mix of avoidant and resistance to parents. So they avoid being around them and they resist any offers of kindness or um, you know, meeting needs. Um, so a child will resist like being fed by a parent. They'll resist hugs. They will wanna go on trips with parents. 
Um, they may seem dazed, confused, or apprehensive in the presence of their parents. Um, and this might look like little baby disassociation when a parent is talking to them. And they may you know, be looking at anything at all in particular uh, when their parent is trying to get their attention. Um, and then, you know, we definitely see that these children with disorganized attachment styles are seen to be acting as a parent or a caregiver toward their parents at a very young, early age. Um, so in disorganized attachment, the child, a little six-year-old, little seven-year-old, eight-year-old, will be managing things that um, parents are responsible for. They might be caregivers to other younger siblings. Um, they might be responsible for, you know, um, chores that are inappropriate for a six-year-old to be responsible for that are not age appropriate, you know what I mean? Um, the thing about the disorganized attachment is that there's very limited non-judgmental information that, you know, turns this into a, this is a problem for someone, this will lead to some kind of suffering. Um, so, and the reason that I think about this is because a child, who can consider the environment, consider what's lacking and then come to provide it, that's a powerful thing. As a spiritual person, it's a powerful thing uh, to, to think about someone so young and so vulnerable with the power to hold it down in their family like that. And removing any judgments that we might have about what is right or what is wrong or what is appropriate providing care for the sake of providing care because it's not there is a very beautiful thing. And it's the hallmark of good karma. And one of the things that I think about that helps me like justify this in my head is the story of Artemis who upon being born turned around and helped give birth to her brother Apollo. And we celebrate that. And so when it comes to disorganized attachment and children who provide care and hold it down in their families because that's what the environment calls for, I don't know if I'm ready to classify that as a kind of disease or a disorder um, as much as uh, something to look at or some characteristics to look at that might help breed some really important characteristics for a selfless society. I do, of course, believe at my core that all children need to be nurtured and need to feel secure and need to be made safe. Right? That is not up for question. However, caring selflessly and the conditions that produce that, we can study that a little bit more and maybe we can get a handle on how to produce that in our child rearing on purpose while providing love and support and creating a generation of children who will only wanna do that for each other. And that's my soapbox on the disorganized attachment and why it's a little bit confusing. As clergy, however, we do have to think about what is the impact of attachment on our participation in the web of life. So our attachments, whether it's secure, insecure, avoidant, ambivalent, disorganized, any of the terms that psychology uses to describe this, our attachments determine what we think and what we believe about the relationships that we are in. And so as people who understand and recognize the role of the web of life in all of our lives and in the interconnectedness of our societies and our cosmos, those of us who subscribe to the idea of as above, so below, what is the impact of attachments on our participation in the web of life? If we do not have trust in our relationships, how does that impact our participation in the web of life? If we do not have a source of support that we can combine in, how does that impact what we believe about life or the purpose of life? And how does that impact our participation? It's important for people who are in positions of clergy, um, who are in positions of leadership, who are teachers, to kind of get at this question and help people understand, like, no, there's, there's something bigger here at stake because how we treat each other, that's a ripple consequence. That goes out and back forever until it becomes unwound and unbound. So one of the solutions, a part of the solution is breaking these cycles of attachment injuries. So breaking cycles of violence, breaking cycles of poverty, breaking cycles of illness, breaking cycles of you know bullying and torment. Um, 
Uh, and this can be done by ancestral or generational healing. This can be done by soul retrieval and present life work, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, this can be done in past life regressions and you know, path working and building future lives and future patterns. Um, and then another part of the solution is uh, recognizing the cycle. So what were its initiating or precipitating factors? How did the environment and the people in the environment and genetics converge to create such an issue or such a crisis or such chaos? It's easier to examine this when we remove judgment and remove blame from the characters at play. So our rider dies while they might be the physical being or the vehicle for the attachment injury or for the family injury, removing judgment and blame uh, and taking it as them just living out their karma the best they could does make it easier to examine what happened and get the facts out and determine what is the best thing to do to get that energy back and to become unbound. The role that tarot of Hecate plays in understanding attachment injuries is, uh, I picked this deck um, for a very specific reason, um, for a few specific reasons, actually. Uh, the tarot of Hecate is a 100 card deck um, that was created and illustrated by Reverend Donald Lewis High Corral. He's the um, first priest of the Corelli Nativist Church. Um, there's a total of 30 major arcana cards um, and he's added magic, soul, mind, heart, body, time, past, and future. Uh, so with these added major arcana cards, we now have a very specific um, and very clear way to understand whether or not the issues that we are working for um, or working through are as a result of a past life, maybe, of a future life, maybe. Um, if we want to use magic as a part of the issue, if we need to search our heart or the collective heart of the universe for the issue, if our own body is at a play um, or if, if you know, another physical body is at play. And then also the concept of time through, uh, thrown in there adds another dynamic for us to understand um, the full picture of how an attachment injury fired, so to speak. In the Tarot of Hecate's three deacons uh, that cover the creation of the universe, the incarnation in life. And that is where a lot of our details and a lot of the story unfolds with regards to an attachment injury. Um, and then the third one talks about transcendence and enlightenment. And that talks about what you have to gain by resolving uh, an attachment injury, transcendence and enlightenment or retrieving a part of your soul and getting that energy back is um, those cards absolutely discuss the benefits or the fruits of being true to a spiritual path um, and working through your karma earnestly um, and on purpose with intention. Um, this deck does come with a book of its own, but just for you know this workshop, uh, the, main, the minor arcana has five suits. So he added a fifth suit. So the swords are air, the cups are water, wands are fire, pentacles are earth. And then the fifth suit that was added by Reverend Don is the suit of lamps. And that represents the suit of spirits, which also adds another dynamic into how we can understand this um, because um, the suit of lamps, I assign a specific meaning when we are doing assessment work for family injuries. Um, and so the lamps, the spirit represents your work, your power, your energy, and your intervention as the reader, as the high clergy, as the witch, um, as the person providing the service. And so in this deck with lamps in here, and you being the magical person um, who's kind of guiding this, uh, this kind of adventure, Having you show up in the deck in the present moment absolutely helps you understand what you have to do to continue helping this person, the one who's sitting down in front of you. And so with these additions to the tarot, I absolutely love this deck for this work. Um, and uh, this, these additions also make for more dynamic interpretations and other kind of ways of reading as well. So here's some of the cards. Um, these are the ones that were added specifically to uh, the Tarot of Hecate. And so right over here, you see the future card. Uh, and it looks um, exactly like uh, that's Icarus and his dad, but there's only one person. But like that's that's the story that it gives right upon first impression. Um, and you know, we can kind of think about 
what this might talk about in a family or attachment injury. Um, uh, for example, um, accolades um, being evenly distributed across family. Um, if that didn't happen, it might feel like some were very, very close to the sun and some were very, very close to the water. And um, you know, growing up like that, it might seem like your parents put you like that on purpose. And that might be, um, you know, this particular card right here being like the future card and having this in here, this means that like perhaps you might have to resolve that in a future life or it's already resolved in a future life or you have to enter a future incarnation yourself through meditation to go ahead and get the answer to that question. Um, and as magical practitioners, we can absolutely help the people that we're working with do that. Um, the body, uh, physical body, it's, you know, that's the symbol of the earth. And then we see like the astral body, which is uh, the moon up there. We see the stars um, and like the sun in particular. And so this also has a particular meaning that uh, has an impact when we are looking for evidence of or reading for family or attachment injuries. Heart, uh, it looks like it could be a rendition of the lover's card, but it is not. The lover's is in this deck and heart is added. Time, past, present, and future are all a part of, uh, wait, maybe not present. I can't remember, hold on. Yeah, so like, maybe not present, but like time, uh, is a card here, the future is a card here, and the past is a card here. And so that right there, um, thinking about that alone is an indication of some things that you can get insight into based on what is showing up and based on some of these meanings. Having the card soul show up in a reading as a major arcana card uh, can be an indication that this is indeed soul work or karmic work. And of course, the mind is the meeting place. That's where our brain and our soul meet to give us interpretations about, you know, what's actually going on. And so when that card shows up, it can give us some important and some good insight into, you know, what we have to do or what we want to know. And so some closer looks at these cards and these artworks. I will say that one of the things that I do like about this deck is that it is super diverse. Um, so one of the suits comes from Japan, one of the suits comes from Europe, one of the suits comes from the Yucatan Valley, one of the suits comes from um, uh, the, um, what do we call them? The, the Pacific Islands. Um, and so these ethnicities are represented in these cards. And so when you are doing readings for someone, sometimes you can rely on the ethnicities that are popping up um, or the colors of the characters that are popping up to give insight to who represents who in the story. Because once we start reading for attachment injuries, once we start reading for healing attachment injuries, um, you know, the, the story becomes co-creational between the deck and between the client or the patient or the participant that you're working with. Um, so when, you know, mine shows up, it might be, you know, tell me about some of the things that you think and some of the things that you believe about your family and how sometimes those things are true and how sometimes those things are not true. And so the things that they tell you will give you insight into what you want to do as far as helping them, what you want to add to the soul retrieval, um, it might give you some insight into what energy constructs you want to start to, you know, put into their aura, into their energetic body as a type of psychic surgery or as a type of, you know, energetic intervention in that way. And having magic show up might mean, you know, what kind of magical things have you been doing to impact this issue and have they been working? And of course, when these show up in reverse, they have reverse meanings. Or they can have reverse meanings if you kind of set that to be the tone of like how you operate. Look at this past card. Look at how this elderly person is looking into the reflective surface of a pool and sees their younger self. And so this card right here, the past card might be an indication that not only um, is this something that happened in the past, but scrying might be something 
that will be healing or a healing practice. So this is the suit of lamps that I was telling you about. The main character is a character named Chak Ek, um, and she is a high priestess on the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and this is you know, her story and her interactions. And when these show up, these represent things that you have to do while the reading or while your consultation is happening. Um, so let's say that the Ace of Lamps show up. Um, in, in, the, in a few slides, I believe I talk about, oh yeah, yeah. So in a few slides, I talk about you know, the various um, cards and like how some of them have a literal representative meetings. Um, when Chak Ek and when the lamps show up, that represents you and you gotta do the thing that the card says right now, like in the reading or in your consultation. Um, so if the Ace of Lamps shows up, we talk about how the Ace in this card represents ancestors. And then when the Ace of Lamps show up, then you immediately start talking about the role of the ancestors in the process. Um, if the King of Lamps shows up, you immediately want to talk about uh, the role of a spiritual figurehead in a lesson that they have imparted on you that is relevant to the situation. Um, but yeah, so the lamps are you and they are the figures in your spiritual life or in your ancestral life or your psycho spiritual life that have given you a gift that you can now pass on for the purpose of healing. You can get the Tarot of Hecate if you're interested in doing this work and learning more about it. You can get it from corellianpublishing.myshopify.com. And I really do recognize, uh, recommend going ahead and getting this deck and taking a look at the dynamic ways that it does really just iron out, um, you know, incarnation, the, the work of the soul, and, you know, just really what it takes to be alive and live life on life's terms. So as an, as an assessment tool in figuring out what happens, start to think about the court cards, uh, the aces, kings, queens, princesses, and princes as those key figures that we talked about earlier. Uh, the aces being ancestors, kings being father figures, queens, mother figures, princesses, sister figures, princes, brother figures. Um, and so these, again, don't have to be your family of origin. These can be your besties and your rider dies. This can be, you know, a queen could be the mother of your best friend who took a special interest in you um, and they are showing up. Um, when major arcana cards show up, these can be uh, karmic circumstances and interferences from your higher self or God. Um, so whereas the king of pentacles might be your dad, the emperor will be Father God. Also consider the role of numbers in here uh, as you know, maybe numbers of offerings, number of times this pattern has happened, um, number of conversations you might have to have before the lesson is learned, a number of times you have to peek the soul retrieval before it takes fully and you know, the person is unbound by the particular attachment injury and so forth. Um, but these are all things that are encoded into these cards that help understand what has to be done in order to help someone. Again, the reading part, the pulling the cards, flip them over, this is the part that becomes co-creational. This is where our clients and, uh, or our participants um, or the folks, whoever it is that we're working with, this is where they co-narrate um, the current circumstances and the struggles. So the cards might say, tell me an interaction between your physical body and your mother that resulted in an attachment injury. They tell you the story, boom. That's what it, that's what co-narrate and co-create means. And so in this way, the cards are illuminating what is happening right now. And boom, just in case you didn't know, this is the thing that is responsible for it. This thing that happened here is why you're going through this now. When the tarot is going to talk about what can happen, um, this is the part where the tarot obviously presents options and choices, um, best and worst case scenarios and steps to take. 
Um, these are all things that can happen as a result of a successful soul retrieval or a successful past or future life regression or a successful yoga practice or what have you. But as a result of your attention to this issue, figuring out what happened and what's happening um, and learning what can happen, this is like the best case scenario. And you can decide, you can do a lot of different things with the cards. Um, so you can say, you can determine like if a happy, healthy relationship with a perpetrator of attachment injury is the result. Um, you can do a continued reading to illuminate, okay, what are the steps that I have to take? And those can be things that you ask for in your soul retreat. You had an abusive mom and you see that the cards are showing a happy, healthy relationship in the future. All right, cards, show me one, two, three. What do I have to do to get there? And you incorporate that into the soul retrieval so that you can make sure that the person that you're working with is getting the tools that they need to be fully energized to do the real world part of that work, which is come into contact with their mom and recognize, you know, what happens to them when they're, you know, in these situations. Um, and then they can apply, you know, tips and skills and magical um, amulets and powders and all that stuff, you know, based on that. But either way, we cannot decide or know what we are going to do until we determine that we want what is, you know, in the future outcome. So do you want what the card says in your future? Uh, if not, got to do another reading. Um, and that's a remediation reading. That's a completely different service. Um, but if you and your client determine that they do want the future outcome that's in the card, then the soul retrieval process is meant to empower them to do the things in the real world that get them there. Again, when the lamps are present, you, the reader, are chakak. When the lamps show up, it's an indication that you, the reader, the healer, the clergy person are to assert a direct magical influence on that particular situation so they can recognize the strength of their own higher self. That's the important part. So when the lamps show up in this assessment process, when you're asking about attachment injuries um, and the lamps show up, the thing that you are going to do, the thing that you have to do in that place is do something that helps them recognize their own power and their own ability to transcend limitations. So some spreads for consideration that can illuminate some of these issues. This one is called the pit. It's seven card spread and can, can discuss situations that led to emotional or relational uh, rock bottoms, as well as components that lead to or away from uh, these conditions. The pentagram, uh, depending on whether the cards are laid out in an invoking or devoking manner, can also impact how the information is used. So if you lay it out in invoking um, a pattern, um, how do you consider that to impact the work that you want to do with your person? And if you do it in a devoking pattern, how do you propose or how do you suspect that will impact the work that you're doing? Uh, and I can tell you from experience that it does have an impact. Um, and if you are, let's say, doing this work on a waning moon and the moon is getting smaller and you want to diminish the impact of attachment injuries on your life or on your client's life, you lay the cards out in a devoking manner. Um, and those will be the things that you start to remove over the course of the waning moon. If you want to increase skillfulness and increase the tools that you use as a result of battling attachment injuries, you lay them out in an increasing or an invoking manner. And as the moon gets full, you start to add qualities to yourself or add things that you practice that are meant to continue uh, to fortify you or make you strong. And that's the way that you can you know, utilize the magic of invoking, depoking pentagrams in the reading process to even get the, the um, jump start and charging the energy for your work and charging your intentions. Is a zodiac spread. Um, so for people who are actively working to heal attachment injuries and wounds um, and are doing it, you know, year round, we'll give insight to what work you'll need to do within the year to come. Um, and so each card around on the outside is, you know, something that you can do over the course of a month. And then the cards on the inside will be like interactions or crossings that um, will be worked on. So in the center, that's what needs to be worked on. One of those cards is January, one's February, one's March, one's April, so on and so forth. What is soul retrieval? 
soul retrieval is a dynamic healing technique, and I classify it specifically as a pastoral or a magical or a spiritual healing technique. It's part energy work, it's part meditative process, it's part collaboration, and you combine with other types of complementary and alternative medicine, specifically yoga. Um, it does require the belief of a greater power that heals and emancipates, and it requires the insight gained from tarot readings. So if you consider soul retrieval um, and, and doing a consultation for someone as a process, one of the things that you have to know in order to get the process rolling in any direction at all, whether it's an attachment injury, whether, you know, they're like, my finances are all, what have, whatever someone, why are you coming to see me? That needs to be an initial question that you are asking anyone. Um, and this immediately puts the onus on them for bringing insight into, you know, what's going on with them. Um, this is not something that you want to do for people that you want to practice on that requires you to go to them and say, hey, can I give you a reading? I'm trying to practice. This is for the, you know, you're an established reader, you know what you're doing, somebody is coming to you and they want some help and you're asking them, hey, why are you coming to me? I'm a witch. I'm a high priest, a high priestess, a high clergy. Right? There are therapists out there, there are doctors out there, you've got best friends. Why are you coming to see me in particular? You have a thought in your head, you have something in your mind already, you have a hope that you think I can do something that these other people cannot do. Why are you coming to see me? Sometimes when you say that to someone who's coming to see you for a reading, all of a sudden they don't know what to say, they have no idea to respond. Um, but this is where you got to give them the time and the leeway and the silence to really get it out there. So people who are doing real soul-based work are often shut down. People who are, have experienced family injuries and attachment injuries are silenced, their perspectives, you know, not valued. And so it, they don't have a lot of practice putting the help that they need or the things that they're experiencing into a form that is coherent to themselves or other people who would want to help them. So when someone is coming to you for some help and it includes some tarot and some magic, do not rush to fill the silence with your own words um, or you know whatever it is that you think you want to offer them. Wait for them to tell you why they are coming to see you. This makes the interaction person-centered from the get-go. And you can be sure that your ego is not doing the work. It's your higher self. It's your, the, the help of your patrons. It's you know, your ancestors. It's the energy that flows through you. Waiting for them to tell you why they're there, that, that starts that alignment process. That starts the building that rapport. And that starts to let them know that they can trust you to meet them where they're at. Usually, Folks are coming for help for one of four reasons or a combination of four reasons. Love, law, finances, and faith. And they are all relationships. Relationships to others is love. Relationships to society is law. Relationships to money is finances. And relationships to spirit is faith. So when is it real soul-based work? And when does it require the aid of high clergy or priesthood or clergyhood or like a witch? Uh, or a shaman, or you know, a, a professional, really, anyone who is, you know, going to objectively provide aid to someone who's struggling. And the answer to that question is when these issues of toxicity or struggle, um, when the common denominator is the person sitting in front of you, um, when they are the common denominator in all of their struggling and distress, but for whatever reason they can't tell that what they are doing is the domino that brings upon these issues. And that is a key reason. No insight that you are your own enemy is the place that you want to be if you're going to be doing real soul-based work. Um, so when you are going to do this work, the soul retrieval, go ahead and ask your higher self, where is God and where is the healing for this person? You know, where is it in this situation? How would their lives improve with restored access to their fuller self? 
um, answering this question will, and um, allowing them to answer this question too, how do you want your life to improve as a result of a reading and as a result of a consultation with a magical person, with a pagan, with a clergy? Um, how do you want your life to improve? This helps um, get everyone in line with what expectations are, what healing will look like, what success will look like, so that you as a practitioner knows if your soul retrieval and your healing was a success, and so that them as a client or the participant knows that the work that was done was a success. Um, as you move into this work, you also want to identify a source of power to help facilitate the retrieval. And this is going to be you know, the spiritual being that you're making offerings to. Ideally, this is a spiritual being that you and your client supplicate to in the beginning when you do your prayers for the readings. Um, this is also going to the spirit that you make your affirmations to at the closing of your work with the client. Um, and uh, one of the things to make sure that you are aware is that you yourself are comfortable and don't have any shadow qualms with the spirit that's being presented by your client or participant. In the soul retrieval, you use guided meditation techniques to help guide your participant through the astral and energetic process. Um, so begin with a few minutes of intentional breathing, uh, engages in the parasympathetic nervous system and allows for the physical relaxation and easier slip into astral awareness. So three minutes of deep breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth, in through your nose, out through your mouth. Um, the more you know about uh, breath work, you can switch it to some breath of fire. You can do some square breathing into the count of four, out to the count of four. Um, but engaging this uh, parasympathetic nervous system in this way and moving into relaxation helps kind of um, disarm uh, the participant uh, like mentally. So relaxation is the counter to stress and you can slip into the astral awareness um, and start to become more easily aware to the little images, um, the sounds, the indicators that spirit is sending while we're doing the work together. Um, and so also everyone who's participating, if you're doing this for an individual, you and your individual are breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth. In, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. You are doing it with your participant. And if you're doing it in a group setting, you are doing it with the entire group because you are also getting into a place of relaxation and you are also moving into a place where you want increased access to your astral awareness. Um, as you move through the soul retrieval guided meditation, as you're um, opening up the chakras and, and, and uh, you know, adding the cues for the energetic charging. So, you know, this energy is coming from higher power. This energy comes from plants. This energy comes from the planet, uh, Mars. This energy comes from Mercury, so on and so forth. As you're zipping up the chakras, um, you can encode cues into your uh, guided meditations that will help you remember when to ask the higher power for a gift. Um, so at this time, we request a gift from the goddess. Um, at this time, we request a gift from a god. Um, and you can potentially insert any energy constructs or other forms of aid into the energetic body um, of the participant that you're working with. Um, you just go through this nice and slow. So um, you start the setting, you take your breaths in, you go into your astral temple and you're continuing to breathe. And now you make your prayer to your higher self and we make our invocation and the invocation is a success and we feel the presence of our higher power right now and our higher power you know, continues to instruct us to breathe and we breathe and we breathe. And now as we you know, breathe, uh, our, our stress falls away and you know, in the astral plane, the environment turns into a path and we start to walk down the path. And we walk down the path and we see a door. It's the first door, it's a red door. We open the door and you know, some red energy comes through and that door is our root chakra and now the root chakra is open and at this time we want to ask the goddess for a gift throw a gift inside that door shut it now we've added a psychic piece of like a psychic surgery into the root chakra that's meant to help it function better that's meant to help it regain its energy as a result of said attachment injury that may have come up in the reading and so on and so forth um, and so like that's an example of you know the soul retrieval meditation like as a process like your chakras can be you know uh, uh, mailboxes they can be ladders that you climb and then eventually, once you are in the presence of the God or goddess or the spirit that you've invoked, um, you have the actual conversation with them about what showed up in the reading. 
So example, uh, you got a reading with the three of pentacles crossed by the prince of cups. Uh, do you remember that we said the princes in the suits were brothers and that cups were water and emotions. So this might be um, an indication that there was a situation in the past where um, the three of pentacles, you as a successful person who worked for your money, um, the relationship with an emotional relationship um, with your brother kind of got in the way of finances and that caused resentment or an injury. Um, if we move into a place where the two of swords is crossed by the empress, the two of swords talks about um, relationships, uh, maybe uh, private relationships um, for convenience or possibly for political reasons. Um, and we see that it's crossed by the empress. Um, this is an indicator that the Holy Mother wants to talk to you or wants you to kind of think about or is giving information about, you know, the way that um, how you relate to goddess figures, Holy Mother figures, because of your relationship with your mom is impacting, you know, your private relationship with other people in the realm of, you know, swords, like air, your thoughts, intellect, and so forth. As another example, let's say that maybe the emperor is crossing the two of swords, and that might mean that the great father God wants you to examine your relationships um, that have a flair of father than father them to them. So not just one relationship that has a daddy figure, but all your relationships that have daddy figures, all of them have a pattern to them that perhaps needs some work and needs some healing. And, you know, that might be what is being illuminated when the emperor is crossed by the two of swords. And then in another example, when the Two of Cups is crossed by the King of Pentacles, this might be an issue of when your dad figure um, or financial father, um, family of origin, family of choice, got in the way um, or caused um, an issue in a romantic um, you know, thing. Uh, you know, dad got in the way money-wise, like maybe, you know, you're person that you're interested in has like a rich dad and like dude is like, nope, can't be my kid. Now there's an attachment injury. Um, or you got a rich fam family member and that person's like, nope, you can't date that person. And now you've got an attachment injury. You know, what, that might be an example of what's, um, you know, being done here. Um, but again, back to the diversity. If you see the two of cups here, like that shows an interracial relationship right there. The king of pentacles is from Egypt. Uh, the swords is Japan. Um, um, and so Ace of Cups, crossing the Two of Cups, this is you, the reader. So remember, um, this is, so sorry, not you, the reader. Ace of Cups is ancestors wanting you to take a look at your performance or your patterns in relationships. Um, so the Ace of Cups showed up and, you know, your ancestor who, this might be an ancestor who, you know, is regarded in your family as, being super great in romantic relationships or like they're known for being like the best husband or the best wife or the best spouse. The Ace of Cups comes forward and that ancestor is like, hey, your relationships, your monogamy, your intimacy kind of thing, like that, it, it's not in line with spiritual values here. Your ancestors are reaching out to tell you and maybe they're reaching out to tell you before God does. And so it might not be as urgent um, as if, that was like maybe the high priestess or the hierophant. Um, so consider that as a dynamic way to apply information. Um, and so if we take a look here, we've got some symbolism that might be helpful in helping us determine like what offerings to make. So for our ancestors, we might wanna get them a special chalice that's only theirs, that serves something to them as you know, a thank you for stepping forward with this healing. Um, you see in the two of swords, there's not swords here, there are actually fans. So that might be an indicator of something that you might want to use as an offering or as a tool in an offering. So you might want to use a fan to, you know, fumigate someone. Uh, let's see. Um, in the Prince of Cups, we see another little cup here. Um, this might be uh, something that you also want to utilize. Like you might want to use a cup and like put some uh, dice in there and like use that. And like that becomes a tool that you use and you only dedicate it to, you know, spirit for so on and so forth. 
I mean, this is, you know, something that you would consider with your, your participant. Um, how do you want to incorporate that into it? Um, what else? Uh, a star shawl, um, baby, infant, um, spades up here. Uh, and like all these other symbols right here, we can see like a Horus head, Sekhmet, I believe. But these are all examples of spirits of influence that we can draw on to continue to power the soul retrieval um, or make offerings or, you know, kind of make the work dynamic. Um, but let's say that the person who's coming to you, uh, your participant, your client, your student, whoever, they're coming to you because they are noticing that many things seem to be going inexplainably wrong in their life. They notice that finances are, you know, going to unforeseen emergencies, flat tires, speeding tickets, um, got to replace things, sneakers got lost, um, you know, broken things, what have you. They notice they've been, there have been more fighting with them and their loved ones and partners. They may express suspicions of cheating or have urges of guilt regarding their own cheating behaviors. Um, they notice that they are irritable around others and folks seem to be misunderstanding them and not seeing their point of view. Um, they may have been triggered into engaging in screaming matches in public or conflicts that result in people being embarrassed for, for them. Um, so if you've ever seen a situation where you looked at it like, wow, I'm embarrassed for the people involved, like that might be a thing. Um, extreme cases could result in physical violence and arrest. Um, and then their own interactions are the common denominator in all their misfortunes and they don't seem to understand that based on their own admissions read for attachment injuries and ask about how some of their early forming um, experiences have kind of you know impacted the way that they relate to the world um, and where there's a deficit that shows up you know you struggle to relate with brothers tight people and so you don't trust or you don't put yourself out there your work across, you know, the tarot reading, the soul retrieval, the guided meditation, the doing the energy work, the healing up these issues is to be the one person that is a secure relationship that delivers exactly as expected. So I do this tarot Hecate soul retrieval over the course of five sessions. And over the course of five sessions, I'm only doing what I say I am going to do. And I am showing up consistently um, and only making agreements that I know I'm going to follow up on. So from the beginning, if I say I'm going to meet with them at five o'clock on Saturday, I'm meeting with them at five o'clock on Saturday. If they're expecting a reading, they're getting a reading. If they're expecting energy work, they're getting energy work. If they're expecting a pendulum, they're getting a pendulum. If they're expecting to have to fill out paperwork, they're filling out paperwork. And if they have an expectation of something that was not going to happen, I'm telling them right away, oh, that was not going to be a part of this session. Um, so, you know, in doing this, in keeping with this consistency, you start to set the stage, you push the first domino for healing attachment injuries in the community or at an institutional level while you work to heal or help them heal or help them feel empowered enough to heal the stuff that's happened in their lives. In a group setting, you as the high clergy or the one in charge can empower certain people that you are trust, uh, that you trust, um, that you know can do good readings and do good energy work. Uh, you can empower them to work alongside you. And so they go and do the techniques, the Reiki healing, the laying of hands, um, the anointing of the oils, the brushing with the fan, the smoking, the smudging, the fumigating, um, or leading the groups of guided meditation so that, you know, you take turns, you know, doing parts and large groups. I definitely do not recommend doing this work um, in groups of larger than like eight um, unless you are going to have another person. And then if you're going to do two facilitators of Tarot of Hecate, two facilitators of soul retrieval, then go ahead and have 20 people. Um, and then I would say, don't go above uh, a workshop um, or um, any kind of uh, offering of this service with more than 30 people and three facilitators. I mean, it just becomes a little bit overwhelming. It's hard to stay organized. Um, and a lot of the details that people are coming with are specific to their kind of healing. Um, and so one of the things that you wanna do is you wanna adjust 
the work that you're doing, you want to start using general language and move away from individual symptoms or individual markers of spiritual distress and just start referring, okay, today we're here healing spiritual distress that is a part of, you know, family attachment injuries. And today we're going to be working specifically on soul retrieval in the root chakra. Um, or today we're going to be working on a complete energetic body soul retrieval where we open up our whole energetic bodies and we open ourselves up to the love of our higher, higher power. They give us a gift in return and we incorporate that into our auras um, and, you know, as a sign of that healing. And the last thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to have them verbalize the things that they will be doing that will tell them and tell you that the soul retrieval and the reading has worked. So will you be talking to your family? Will you be going to barbecues? Will you be less triggered when someone says something that is um, not consistent with what you remember? Will you know or have better ways of responding to invalidation from your family? Um, these things uh, are important. Um, they bring them to the forefront of the mind uh, and, and help, you know, uh, not only give you confidence in the work that you're doing, but it helps you recognize like, yeah, this is like, boom, we did this soul retrieval, you got the things, uh, happy for it. Go ahead and continue the process on your own. You know, once you teach someone soul retrieval and how to go ahead and get about the information, it becomes unlikely that they have to do it so intensively um, over the course of five sessions with uh, a provider in the future. Um, and the only time that they would have to come back is if there's another issue that's so deeply ingrained that they just can't seem to let go of on their own. Um, so that is my time. Thank you for joining me on my discussion about Tarot of Hecate, attachment and family injuries and soul retrieval and how we as clergy can utilize this technique to support the healing of our communities. Um, I think that with paganism, with witchcraft being the fastest growing faith you know, on the earth, people who are clergy, people who are leaders in this area are charged with a special responsibility to make up for some of the injustices of the old spiritual regime, so to speak. And the old spiritual regime did use religion and spirituality to justify abuses. And so those of us who are standing up now, we have a responsibility to put a squash on those old ways. And like, actually, uh, they're, we're, we're going to heal it, we're going to mend it, and we're going to be stronger for it. And we're going to use this new strength to help build a new future that's more appropriate for everyone involved. Um, so again, thank you for joining me. These are uh, my references for attachment theory. These are my references for, come on. Um, lifespan and uh, degree studies. Um, if you would like to uh, learn more about me, about what I do, about how I practice this, um, if you want a consultation, you can reach out to me. Um, I am Phoenix Hoffman Williams on Facebook. Uh, you can reach out to me. I am rev.phoenix1 at gmail.com. Um, certainly reach out to me. Um, and uh, if you go to the website events.bluedoor, or excuse me, bluedoorevents.weebly.com, that's uh, the current host site for the Blue Door, um, the education and the uh, um, pastoral counseling program that I'm running. Um, you can go directly to those websites, to uh, um, bluedoorevents.weebly.com, and you can schedule an appointment. And that appointment can be like, I just want to learn more about the technique. Um, I want some coaching and how to, you know, uh, implement it for my coven um, or my temple or for my circle. Um, I want to have a, a family attachment um, consultation and, you know, you want to do that for yourself. You can reach out to me and do that there. Um, or if you want to send people my way who you think would benefit from knowing more about this, uh, you can send them that email address as well. Thank you for watching. Thank you for giving me your time. I hope you found it helpful. Um, and I look forward to hearing from anyone who wants to learn more. Love you all and blessed be.